And so um, that's really where psychology gets its roots. I wouldn't call what Socrates and Plato do necessarily psychology, but it, kind of, it, it starts the roots in the process about thinking about human behavior and our knowledge and our thought processes and things like that. And so the whole gist of this nature nurture debate is basically, am I born knowing everything I'm going to know, um, kind of already filled in and already complete, or am I nurtured by my environment, by the people around me? I grow knowledge, I gain knowledge as I go. And so the easiest way I think to kind of keep the beginning kind of roots of our psychology psychologists um, straight in your head would be to kind of do a little T-chart like I have here and put nature on one side, nurture on the other side. And on the nature side, the names that you just have to kind of memorize would be Socrates, Plato, and Descartes. And the big thing is just knowing that they believe that knowledge is innate. We're born with it. We have what we have, and that's all we're going to be in life is what we're born with. And then on the flip side of that are the psychologists who would say, hang on a second, that's not true at all. We've got the nurture side of the debate with Aristotle and Francis Bacon and John Locke. And so those are kind of the names you have to memorize. This unit has just a lot of names thrown at you. And so if you can give those names some context, you're gonna have an easier time remembering who goes with what. So I would start with here, the nature, the nurture, make some sort of a chart to, to remember who goes where. And then the big thing that goes with the nurture side of this debate is this idea of a tabula rasa. And so um, John Locke would say that we are a tabula rasa, which is a blank slate. I'm born completely blank. And my knowledge, um, my experience is what writes on the slate of my life. And so as I experience things, my slate begins to fill up and I begin to um, fill in and become who I am. This leads us to also kind of the roots of empiricism. And when we start talking about empiricism, which is, you know, using observation and more scientific methods, that's what's going to lead us into, um, into more modern or more traditional forms of science and psychology. Because right now, this whole nature nurture debate isn't very scientific, um, but it's getting there. And so we'll talk about that with the history approach to this. And then the next topic that we move on from nature and nurture are these two ideas of structuralism versus functionalism. And so these are considered probably the earliest roots of what we would call actual psychology. So nature and nurture debate that's been happening for hundreds of years, and it's still going on. We still talk about it in psychology, but those early roots aren't super scientific. This structuralism versus functionalism is a little more scientific and it's going to be the kind of early roots then of what we're talking about for psychology. Um, so structuralism is sometimes kind of confusing because it's this kind of vague term, but really what's happening here is psychologists have people sit down and use introspection to report their experiences and their feelings and whatever is happening inside their brains and their minds. And so um, some of the early experiments would be like dropping a ball and having someone react to hearing that ball and talk about what they're feeling or what they see. And so that's the introspection. You're looking inside yourself, talking about those different things. Um, two of the big names that you have to remember then that go with this are Wundt and Titchener. Um, and a little trick to help you remember who goes with structuralism Structuralism starts with an S. Wundt and Titchener start with WT. All of those letters are at the end of the alphabet. So if you get stuck trying to remember who goes with what, just know the S and the W and the T all at the end of the alphabet. That should give you a little hint to help you remember who goes with what. So anyways, the structuralism uh, debate or the structuralism idea that's going on is having people self-report. And so one of the issues with structuralism, why it maybe isn't as good as it could be, is that first of all, it's what the mind or your consciousness were. Because as soon as something happens, and then I try to talk about it, it's already in the past. So it's not giving me an immediate current snapshot. It's my interpretation of what has already happened. And so that makes structuralism kind of vague, kind of hard to use. Another problem is 
it really depends on being articulate. If you aren't very verbal, if you don't express yourself well, you might report an experience in an inaccurate way. And so then that structuralist approach isn't very useful anyways, because it's not giving a good picture of what's going on inside you. Um, so in response to structuralism, that comes first, structuralism, is this idea of functionalism. And functionalism then is looking at how all those things in our mind actually work to form our consciousness. So how do all of these separate parts come together and form like who I am as a human, as a conscious, sentient being? And um, the names you kind of have to know for this one, this psychology, like I said, this unit is big on names. So I'm gonna give you tips to help you remember. Um, James and Darwin, and the same trick applies here, J, James, D, Darwin, and F, functionalism are all towards the beginning of the alphabet. So those three names all go together towards functionalism. And so if you look at the root of the word functionalism, function, it kind of, it tells us how the mind and consciousness work. And so a good analogy to think of here to remember the difference between structuralism and functionalism is thinking about a car. If I took apart a car engine right now, threw all the pieces out on the floor and had you look at them. Unless you were super, super into cars, that's not going to tell you how a car works, right? That's the structuralist approach. It's looking at the carburetor, the, oh gosh, I can't name parts of the car, the carburetor, the, the place where the oil filter goes, the, all the different pieces of the engine and just looking at them all as separate pieces and trying to figure out how a car works. It probably wouldn't be a very successful approach. The functionalist approach puts all of those pieces together, looks at them as a whole and says, oh, so that's how the car works. We put all the pieces together. Now we can understand how consciousness or how the mind works. Um, we've looked at structuralism and we've looked at functionalism. And then the key here then is that you need to be able to tell the difference between the two. And so going back to that car metaphor, or we could also think about a puzzle metaphor the main difference between structuralism and functionalism is that structuralism is trying to figure out the individual pieces like of a puzzle. And functionalism is taking those pieces and actually putting them together to see how they work together and make that big picture for us. And what behaviorists do is basically try to find a more concrete method to think about human behavior, behaviorist behavior. And so they focus completely on observable, outward behavior because that's more concrete. I can look at you as a trained psychologist and see what you're doing and make observations about that versus trying to get into your consciousness, into your mind and figure it out. The behaviorists are a response to those, to that approach. The big names you have to know here are Watson and Skinner. Um, I don't have a trick to remember those two, sorry. But we will have a whole unit about learning and behaviorism and you'll learn all about Watson, all about Skinner. So I wouldn't stress about it too much. This is just kind of the overview of how they came about. And so after the behaviorists and their observable approach to psychology, in the 1960s, we see another approach created and that's the humanist approach. And the humanist approach is basically kind of touchy-feely, lovey-dovey sort of approach to psychology because um, they felt that the behaviorists kind of treated humans almost as like robots and they just um, interacted with things in their environment without emotion, without feeling. And so the humanists like to focus on how our current environment inhibits or helps us grow. And so this is a really nurture approach to psychology, kind of less nature, more nurture. And it's all about human potential and growth. And so maybe you've heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I'm going to highlight that later on. But it's all about saying that eventually, you know, my goal is to be the best person I can be. So if you think about a pyramid, the very tippy top of that pyramid is like my self-actualization, being the best I can be. So this approach to psychology, I think, is really positive and really, really nice. It focuses that we can all be the best person that we can be. And then the two names that go with this approach are Maslow and Rogers. And again, I wouldn't stress too much right now about them. You know, a question might pop up on the test about them, but you'll learn a lot more about them as we progress through the unit.
what is psychology then, right? This is this class that we're taking. And so we look at the functionalist approach, which is in kind of an, a more outdated method. Now we have more scientific methods of dealing with psychology, but psychology is the science of behavior and mental processes. And so we've combined both the behaviorist approach, the humanistic approach, the functionalist, all of these different approaches to kind of come up with this broad definition that psychology is the science or the study of both the outward behavior and the inward mental processes. And so I just want to highlight then the different perspectives that your teachers are probably talking about right now. And we've touched on some of them, the behavioristic factors, um, the humanistic factors. So there's seven kind of main perspectives right now in psychology. Um, but the reason I'm just showing you this right now is to basically highlight that there's not just one way to think about psychology. Um, you could study psychology in a lot of different ways and a lot of different people do, and that doesn't make it right or wrong, but we just have to learn about all of them to really understand psychology as a whole. And so the best approach then to take when studying psychology is a biopsychosocial approach. And this is something I stress every year with my students a lot. And basically the biopsychosocial approach says, well, I know it's not just nature and I know it's not just nurture. I know there's lots of factors at play when I'm talking about any sort of human behavior or motivation. And so it takes those multiple factors and looks at any sort of behavior in a variety of ways. And so instead of it has to be just biological or it has to be just behavior, it looks at it as a complementary thing. And so if we talked about, let's say depression really briefly, um, depression and the causes of depression, a biological psych psychologist might say, well, yeah, there's clearly you know, things to do with different levels of neurotransmitters and hormones in the body that can lead to people experiencing depression. However, we also know that social factors or external factors in our environment like stress, um, that's usually one of the causes, like stress and things like that could also play a role in depression. So one of those factors by itself might not explain the depression, but if we look at all of those factors together, it could explain why someone experiences depression. And so using a biopsychosocial approach is really probably the best way to approach most problems in psychology because it looks at more than just more than just one facet of the problem. Um, so usually uh, the thing to remember is that even though you do a bio unit or you do a cognition unit, yes, we're highlighting those specific aspects, but it's always important to come back to this approach and remember that it's not mutually exclusive. These things complement each other and go together.